Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm James Harding. I'm the editor and co-founder of Tortoise. Uh, and as you'll see, one of the things that we try to do at Tortoise, an open and slow newsroom, is figure out ways that we might put the world of news to music. And my colleague, Mark St. Andrew, tries to think of the most appropriate song. Born of Frustration, I suppose, says something about the long wait that uh, Prince Charles uh, has had for the moment that he becomes king. And the question that we're facing is, what kind of king will he be? We, we, we do this in really the whole spirit, in the whole manner that Tortoise was created, which was to say, imagine you took an editorial meeting, your average news meeting, and thought to yourself, instead of having just a room full of journalists, have a group of people that have different experience, different expertise on the subject, and then open it up to all of us so that we all might bring our points of view, um, and in some cases, our personal stories of the subjects at hand. And in this particular case, one of the things we've been trying to think about at Tortoise is, let's face it, there's so much criticism of journalism around the royals. There's such a sense that we don't really understand the people who, not just the queen as head of state, but the royal family. Can we approach the subject differently and learn and understand better who they are and the role they play? And so this evening's thinking is intended to inform our future journalism on the subject of Prince Charles himself and the royal family more generally. As you'll see, we're incredibly lucky to be joined by uh, Ingrid Seward, who is not only a royal biographer, but editor-in-chief of Majesty magazine, and someone who has truly studied this subject uh, for some time. Uh, likewise, uh, Giles Brandreth. Uh, it, it's, I, I feel as though Giles Brandreth should be given a break from thinking and talking about the royal family, not least since your book, Giles, came out, but also, of course, you know, following the death of Prince Philip. So much time that you were being asked to tell, to, tell the stories and the observations you had. Um, and David McClure, um, who I think has been to a thinking of ours before, David, you know, is the is the sort of foremost expert, I think, in this country on the finances of the royal family. And often what seems like a personal spat amongst the royals is best understood by, by examining the finances um, within and uh, between members of the royal family. So David, it's very good to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, we have a very simple, uh, but not very forcefully enforced rule here, which is no questions. We want people to share what they think, share their points of view. So please do, don't hold back. I know that people have uh, strong feelings and different points of view about uh, Prince Charles. And, um, and the monarchy more generally. And we want to hear and think uh, about him and about his role. I'm going to start in Rudolf, if, like, if, if I may, with you, um, because you've written about uh, Prince Charles in quite some detail and actually tried to answer the question in front of us, which is what kind of king you think he'll be. So tell us. Oh, you're talking to me? Yes, I am, very much. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, well, I think he will be a very good king. But then I would say that, but I think it's because he cares so much and he cares about the future and he cares about what his children or our children and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren, what kind of world they're go going to inherit. So I see him as very forward thinking. And also I he was a very late developer. My, my late husband was at school with him at Gordonston and told me many, many a tale about him. And Charles had a very uh, difficult time at Gordonston, but um, he then admits later, although he loathed that it did shape his development. And I remember my husband telling me that he used to, um, instead of hanging out with the other boys and sort of smoking behind the, you know, the wood pile or something, he'd go down to the river with a book of Shakespeare's sonnets in his pocket. Now I find that very unusual for say a 16 or 17 year old boy. So he was always a, a great thinker. And I think that little tale tells me an awful lot about him. And I hope it tells you a bit about him. And, and what do you say, because I heard, heard similar stories. One of them was around, for example, his time at Cambridge that he, that he was on a staircase in, at Trinity College and he was on the first floor and there might be a gathering of people on the ground floor and a group of people getting together on the floor above him. But somehow, and perhaps that's what it's like if you're the future king, but also for reasons of personality, he felt awkward in necessarily going upstairs or downstairs and stayed in the room on his own. How much do you think the perception that we have of him 
as being someone, as you say, who's intellectually very engaged, but emotionally finds it much more difficult to connect. How fair you think that is? I think that's probably very fair. I think it was fair then. I think, as I said, he's a very late developer and used that, uh, you know, early time to, you know, to, to get into himself. I mean, he talked about sp spirituality when he was very young. He he used to go to this island in Greece and sort of lie on, on a bed made of stone in, in a monastery. I mean, all things that you think uh, were very wacky then, but you don't think it's so wacky now because he wanted to meditate and he wanted to, I suppose, find himself. And I think this prepared him in a way for, for the future, although he did have his critics, especially among politicians. I mean, Margaret Thatcher thought that he, he was an incomplete man. Um, and you know, a, lot of, a lot of politicians didn't like him because he would get very keen on a subject and then get bored with it and go on to something else. Um, mm -hmm. So to my mind, I think he's probably really come into his own, perhaps, you know, sadly, after the de death of his wife. I think it, it allowed him to become the person that he now is. And when you say an incomplete man, just explain, Ingrid, what what you understood Margaret Thatcher meant by that. What people, when they, they they've they've attributed such things to him, mean by that? Oh, I don't really know what she meant by it. It's just, I mean, it, it, it's a telling expression. But I mean, you could interpret it in several ways. I think she felt he wasn't a well-rounded person. He was something was missing. To my mind, incomplete is when something is missing from somebody's personality or their character. And I think that's what she meant. And I don't, um, as she didn't say it to me and I couldn't question her, I don't know exactly, but I would say that she felt there was part of him that was missing um, <laughs> for, for someone whose role was to be a future king. And in, Charles in a moment, if I might, but what the, one of the com complaints, criticisms, queries about Prince Charles, is actually the mirror of what you said, that yes, rather than being a good king because he cares too much, the risk of him is that because he has passion, some call them pet projects, a willingness to weigh in on issues that people might otherwise think are matters of public policy and not the, the place of a constitutional monarch who shouldn't intervene in the politics of everyday life. It's exactly the fact that he, as you put it, cares so much that's going to mean that he's a problem when he becomes king. I don't think he will be a problem at all when he becomes king. That's why, you know, he's so anxious to get on with everything now. I don't think, you know, obviously he, he it's his destiny to be king. He knows he is going to be king and he doesn't want to give it up to his son because he wants his son to have a bit of a life before he takes up the reins of the monarchy. No, I think that once Charles becomes king, he won't be able to do all of these things. And he, his hands will be very tied. Right. And, and I, think, I think he will do it as he thinks he should do it, uh, as traditionally, you know, being the monarch means not interfering. I don't think he will interfere anymore. Ingrid, thank you. I'm going to come back to you in a second. Uh, I'm going to come in a moment to Peter Flynn, and I want to come to Yelena Sofronevich as well, partly because I'm really interested in the crown perspective on King Charles, oh, on Prince Charles, on how you see him, if that's what the, the lens through which you see him. And I'm interested in Peter Flynn's point on suits. We'll come back to the moment. But Giles, um, Bradford, um, I imagine, start, I mean, I know that you, you, you know, you're the author of this, the biography now on Prince Philip. But I wonder where that's an interesting place to start, the father-son relationship, even before you get to Gordonston, what your reading of that relationship was. I think it's a very good place to start. I mean, my feeling generally about the Prince of Wales is that he has made his life as the Prince of Wales. And to make his life interesting and useful, he has focused on that. And when in the fullness of time he becomes king, and I don't think he is either frustrated or in a hurry, uh, one of the the great people in his life was the late Queen Mother, who he was pleased to see live to 101. And I'm sure he hopes his own mother will live that long, if not longer. So he's got quite a way to go still as Prince of Wales. But he, I, I had a conversation some years ago with the Duke of Edinburgh about Prince Charles. And I said, why is it that I read and hear that you and Prince Charles are at odds with one another? 
we keep hearing this, when to me you seem so similar. I mean, you're similar physically, you walk in the same way, you talk in the same way, you, you fiddle with your cuffs in exactly the same way. And his interests are your interests, the environment, spiritual things, all the things that you have aspired to, looking after young people. Everything you care about, he cares about too. And yet people say you're different, uh, you don't get on. And he stopped me, because I, I was saying, you're so similar. He said, stop, there is a difference. And the difference is this. Uh, Prince Charles is a romantic, and I'm a pragmatist. And a romantic sometimes thinks a pragmatist is unfeeling. And of course, uh, Prince Philip was not at all unfeeling, but he was a very different sort of person. And he reflected his generation. He once pointed me, Prince Philip, in the direction of a uh, he was quite interested in Napoleon, read quite a few books about Napoleon. He won, he's reading one quite recently, uh, not long before he died. And Napoleon pointed out that if you want to understand a person, you should look at what the world was like in the year that person turned 21. And Prince Philip turned 21 in 1942 and reflects absolutely the values, attitudes of that generation, what many people often call the greatest generation. That's the sort of person he was. Think about when Prince Charles turned 21, it was the late 1960s. And he reflects somebody of 1969, 1970. And he is romantic, that is his disposition. So two very contrasting people with same interests, different approach. What I think, and I'm going to agree with Ingrid here, is Prince Charles used to complain about his childhood and talk to various biographers, Tony Holden, later Jonathan Dimbleby, about how he felt as a child. Uh, he pictured himself in his perambulator with the high walls. He felt his loneliness. Uh, he felt unhappy as a child. He didn't like Gordonston. But he was saying these things, I think, when he was in a dark place. And uh, I think if you asked him now about these very same things, he wouldn't feel, he wouldn't express them in quite the same way. He's now in a much sunnier place than he was in the 1980s and 1990s when he may have been saying those sorts of things. So I see him now as somebody who is a reflection of both his parents, who is at ease with what he is doing and satisfied with what he is doing, but knows full well the nature of monarchy because he's seen his mother do it so successfully. And one, one final thing to say about the nature of monarchy and how aware they are about what the monarch, the sovereign can now do. Because I said to the Duke of Edinburgh, when the queen became queen, were there, you know, were there people telling you what to do, what your role was? And he said, no, there were people telling me what not to do. Uh, and I said, well, there was the example of the Prince Consort. And he said, That's, the queen, Queen Victoria was an executive monarch and the Prince Consort was her private secretary. They could do things. The queen is a constitutional monarch. There was no role for me. And no. uh, we don't need, need to go into that. But the point is, the sovereign is a constitutional monarchy. And what Prince Charles has done is use, I think, with hugely effectively, his passions, his interests over a wide range of areas to make a difference as well as making a noise. But he knows that that has been the privilege of his life to be the Prince of Wales. And when he becomes king, you know, in 10 years or so, whenever it happens to be, uh, he will then be, as his mother was before, a constitutional monarch. And Charles, do you think, uh, by the way, I'm really fascinated by that point about 69, 70, because, of course, you know, if you asked anyone to pick someone who looked like a child of the 60s or the 70s, you know, you wouldn't think of Prince Charles. And in fact, it must be, it's really interesting to think of the influence of that time upon him in his mindset, if not in his certainly outward appearance or behaviour. But what I'm really trying to say is, is that we're all like that. When you see, as it were, Prince William and Prince Harry and the new, the new huggy generation, where you let it all hang out, where you talk about your feelings and your emotions, mm -hmm. that reflects the world that they were in when they were 21. The mm -hmm. fact that the Duke of Edinburgh had a stiff upper lip wasn't because he was an awkward person who had a troubled childhood, though he did have a troubling childhood, but he refused to acknowledge it as a troubling childhood because that's what you did of that time. So I think Prince Charles reflects his time. And, to be honest, there were other boys of 16 who went down to the river 
uh, to read sonnets by Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> I also have to say I like Ingrid's reference to uh, you know lying on a stone in uh, in Greece. The idea that the future kings sort of discovered yoga holidays long before they became fashionable is uh, is appealing to me too. I I'm gonna I'm gonna go to David in a moment, but but Charles, I just want to ask you one other thing, which is about there's there's uh, um, Ben Morris wrote in the chat, which I rather loved, asked whether or not you were standing up as you were speaking out of you know respect for the royal family, and I think someone else said that maybe it was just good for your circulation. But but I want to ask you about the sort of the business of being Giles Brandreth in commenting and thinking publicly about the royal family, because it feels as though this is a very polarized business. There are either, if you like, critics of the royal family, and when it comes to Prince Charles, and I suppose when it comes to the royal family, particularly Prince Charles, and then there are, if you like, supporters of monarchy and the royal family and that you, you find yourself both given kind of access and having relationships with them individually but on I suppose an understanding that at some point you're going to have to keep your private reservations exactly that private that it becomes less easy to be a critical commentator of the prince particularly or the royal family and I just wonder how you think about that how you actually approach it because you must reflect on it a fair deal I'm I'm very relaxed about that. Uh, I often remember the the, the, the story about uh, whoever it was who I think prosecuted uh, Carson Edward Carson, who prosecuted Oscar Wilde in the famous Oscar Wilde case, and he um, he prosecuted him though they'd been contemporaries at university. He prosecuted him because he had never had dinner with him, and he had a rule that anybody whose hospitality had accepted he would never prosecute. So there might never have been that extraordinary cross-examination of Oscar Wilde by Edward Carson had they had dinner, because they met a few weeks before the trial by chance. And Carson said to Wilde, oh, we must meet up sometime and have dinner. And it didn't happen. And had it happened, Oscar Wilde might have been spared. Uh, so of course, if you do accept hospitality from people, it does slightly change. And I've been fortunate enough over many years to have many encounters with uh, Prince Charles. But I'm very mindful First time I went to a royal garden party years ago, I found myself in the same in the in the grand tent with uh, James Callaghan, who just become prime minister. And I said, "Oh, here you are, uh, Mr. Callaghan. You're now, you know, prime minister, friends with the, uh, the queen." He said, "No, no, 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 no." He said, "You must remember, uh, senior royalty. They offer you friendliness, not friendship." My boy, you remember the difference, and I always have. And though the Duke of Edinburgh, over many years, showed me many acts of friendship. I never presumed to think of myself as a friend. Uh, he was friendly towards me and I felt he showed me signs of friendship, but I was conscious always. And you are with royalty. There's this invisible moat around them, most particularly around the queen, of course, but mm -hmm. even around other members of the royal family. Nobody is entirely normal with them. So right. I'm quite aware of that. I, so I'm very ready to be critical and I'm very relaxed about it. And interestingly enough, they are very relaxed about it. I remember the Duke of Edinburgh saying, you know, when, I, when we were in Canada uh, and there was lots of protests about us, I said to the Canadians, if you don't want us, we can go away. We don't have to do this. If it's useful, we'll do it. We'll help out. Uh, but if you don't want us, we'll go away. So I, I rather feel that about the, the I mean, to me, it seems to be a system that works. I quite, I quite like it. I think it. But Charles, but you're, but you're saying that you've never, you, you, you what you're saying is you never, you've never had dinner. What you've done is they've been friendly, but you've never had that kind of. No, you know, no. I'm saying that once you have accepted hospitality, okay. uh, it does change things. And oh, I, I, and I, I, yes. And so, for example, my biography of the of Prince Philip uh, was not authorized, but it comes with authority. And I spent a lot, I mean, it was a nightmare, to be honest. Uh, I'll just tell you this one story and then I will shut up. Uh, it's a nightmare because the first time I did it, uh, it's had various incarnations to this latest one, the final portrait. First time I did it was at his request for his 80th birthday. He needed a biography written. And because I'd interviewed him, um, he said, will you do it? And I, and I did it. But I then had to go scrunching across the gravel to Buckingham Palace to present it to him. And he began reading it and say, what is this you're saying? My father floated down to the south of France. Why do you say that? And this was because his parents, Prince Philip was, um, went into exile as a baby and his parents split up by the time he was 10 and his parents split up. His mother went into an asylum and his father floated down to the south of France and lived with his girlfriend there. And Prince Philip was only 10. 
He said, why are you saying my father totally died? I said, well, I'm trying to convey, sir, that your father was something of a boulevardier, uh, enjoyed the occasional glass of wine and a well-turned ankle. And I thought the expression floated down to the south of France conveyed that rather deftly, sir, discreetly, and yet rather deftly. He said, my father did not float down to the south of France. My father went by train. <laughs> uh, he was a stickler for accuracy. All that interested him were the notes at the back about his sort of appointments and uh, what paths he'd redesigned at Windsor and how he'd you know, helped put a new roof up. So uh, doing things in cooperation can be difficult and it's, it, is a, it is a line to tread. So I am a, a fan of the royal family and I've been lucky enough to occasionally meet a number of them. So, uh, Charles, that's, that's really interesting. And actually, I, I hadn't heard that as a way of thinking about things. Not that you can't speak about people from whom you've accepted hospitality, but that you just sort of need to be honest and open about the fact that the terms change once that's happened. I think, yeah. uh, I think it's interesting. I'm going I'm to definitely come back. And Charles, by the way, it seems that while you've been speaking, there's a long queue of people who want to go out for a long, boozy lunch with you. It seems float down to the south of France. <laughs> um, they're not even sticking their hands up. It's very sweet. I see that, Sudi. I'm going to come da uh, to David McClure, though, because David, I suppose that one of the tensions around Prince Charles in particular is this sense that it's one thing to talk about his causes and his passions. It's another to talk about his business interests. And uh, and he does have business interests. He does have a you know, financial profile, doesn't he? So will you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I suppose his main business interest is his, his duchy, the Duchy of Cornwall, which is essentially his cash cow. Last year brought in about 20 million pounds a year. And without that, he really couldn't sustain his quite lavish lifestyle. And indeed, he, you know, he used to subsidize Prince, Prince William and Harry to the tune of about five million pounds a year to do their constitutional duties. So I think the most important thing that allows him to lead the life he does is this 21 million pounds a year that he's got from the duchy. And let's remember that money has gone up quite a lot. It's gone up by, uh, it's trebled in about 20 years. So if he could get by on about eight million pounds, in the year 2000, he's got, you know, 20, 22 million pounds now. He must be doing pretty well. But, you know, he's sometimes portrayed, I think in, in some of the literature for this discussion, he was described as an astute businessman. I, I would take issue with that. I, I think he's an astute fundraiser. You know, he's certainly one of the most, uh, the biggest philanthropists in Britain. I think he's got his Prince's Foundation, I think has about 400 charities behind it. And there's no doubting whatsoever that he has enormous ability in uh, in getting some of his rich friends to open that to to, uh, to write checks for him, you know, <laughs> for some of his favorite causes, and you know, all, all 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 credit for him for doing that. But when it comes to running other things, you know, there has been question marks about how he's run some of his charities. Some things have had to be reorganized. The classic, you know, everyone knows about the Duchy originals, you know, the milk and all of this. But actually, that 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 was a failure, um, and it had to be bailed out by Waitrose. So mm -hmm. not all, his, all not all his projects come off, and he's not quite as an astute uh, businessman as some people maintain. And David, what about the way in which he spends? The reason I ask about that is that one of the things that emerged, I think it was in it was you know a couple of years ago now, in the summer of two thousand and nineteen. That taught us we held a series of thinkings and one was about the four households of Windsor and it was the beginning to distinguish between the Queen and uh, Prince Philip, um, the Prince of Wales um, and, and Camilla, Dutch of Cornwall, and then the emergence of William and Harry and, and those two households. And one of the questions that, that began to pursue Charles at that stage was the way in which he distributed money and was expected to distribute money through the family. And I wonder whether you can explain a little bit about that, because that, I suppose, will tell us a little bit about how the family operates and about how he thinks about the future of the royal family. Well, the thing is that the money is sort of top-ended, as it were. The two richest royals are the Sovereign and the Prince of Wales. The reason why they're rich is because they have their own duchies. The Queen has a duchy of uh, Lancaster, which brings in about 22 million pounds a year. Again, that's trebled in about 20 years. And the Prince of Wales, by virtue of being Prince of Wales, has his duchy of, uh, of Cornwall. Now, in a sense, they use that money to cross-subsidize other members of the royal family who, don't have, don't, who do not have these cash cows. So the Queen uses her 22 million to pay for the, the, the running costs of maybe half a dozen uh, senior royals who do 
who are working royals who do official duties, like uh, in the past Prince Andrew, but also Prince Edward. And likewise, uh, Charles uses his money, his Duchy of Cornwall, his 21 million pounds. He uses some of that, up until recently, about five million pounds a year to pay for the, the offices of, of William and Harry. Although there's always been a suspicion that uh, some of that money isn't purely for formal work, it's also for their lifestyle. Mm. And you know, when you look at some of the more junior roles, you do wonder what, say, Prince Edward is living off. He lives in enormous uh, Bagshot, Ma Bagshot Park, enormous mansion in the countryside, and how he can afford to pay for that, I, I do not know. So I think there's a sense in which the sovereign and the next in line uses their all the extra money they get from their cash cows to subsidize the other royals. Um, which, I, which I imagine creates its own, well, I mean, you can only can imagine creates its own strains. David, I'm- yeah, It also it creates leverage. It gives oh, you sorry. power to keep uh, members of the family in line. If you are subsidizing errant people like, I don't know, when Prince Edward famously filmed uh, William uh, at university, if you were paying for some, or the, the queen was subsidizing them, but if you were Charles were doing it, you would have leverage over these people. I, I want to, David, I'm going to come back to that, if I might. I wanted to go to Peter Flynn. I see Geoffrey Gruder makes an interesting point about the way in which Charles may or may not step in as uh, king when he becomes king. Um, so, so but can I start, and I'm, I said I'm going to come to you later on the sort of the crown lens on this, but Peter, um, Tell us, I know you made the observation about the suits. You also made the observation about the comparative, you know, scrutiny of the Queen's finances and Prince Charles's. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about, you know, your experience of this and how you see it. Um, so just for everyone on the, on the, uh, the thinking, I was the Prince of Wales' equerry for a couple of years and so worked with him quite closely. Um, in terms of what I've heard so far, yeah, um, it, it's, it's pretty much, um, we're, we're covering the ground we, we recognise. In terms of him as an individual, I found him, his work ethic was absolutely phenomenal, completely dedicated, and uh, he, he was um, so hardworking um, and uh, almost metronomic in terms of, you know, his routine. Um, he, there were some subtleties within some of the things that the, the commentators have said so far that I, I sort of recognise and I could probably add a bit of value to. Um, he has, yes, absolutely right, David, hundreds and hundreds of charitable, I think there were, on my list, there were about 700 different organisations, entities, military units that he was, he was involved with, with patronage or, or support or as a charitable entrepreneur. And aligned to that was he sort of he never really other than a couple of jewels in the crown like the prince's trust he never really prioritized and that as a military guy used to absolutely frustrate me but then i also found it was actually slightly self-protecting because if he never went in too hard and too deep it was almost politically protecting himself and so from what started off for me as sort of an initial frustration i got to i got to sort of see the wisdom in it in the end and, and sort of accept it the other the other thing i found as well that um was uh, was was hugely effective was his convening power he that's that that was his real raison d'etre his ability to convene and then the time i saw him um with all this butterflying he did around all the different things the time i saw him most engaged and energized was on the time we have left in terms of planetary health that was the one thing i saw him get the most excited about I've, I've watched the comments here as well, and there's a sort of blend of, 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 of interest in things like the Duchy of Lancaster and Duchy of Cornwall. And I was just typing reply to that in that if you, I remember when, when I served with the, with the Prince for a couple of years, very lucky years actually over the, the wedding of the Cambridges and then the, the Jubilee and the, and, the, and, the, and the Thames pageant and the, and the like, and the arrival of Prince George. And so I had a fantastic few years. Um, but I remember at the time the, the sort of scrutiny, particularly publicly, of the Duchy of Cornwall finances and the, the regular, you know, air miles and all the other sort of commentary you get in the, oh, look, who's flown where and how much it's cost. And it was always very much concentrated on the Duchy of Cornwall because we didn't really go after the Queen and the Duchy of Lancaster. And, and the sort of the, the finances are broadly sort of equivalent in terms of revenue raised. But, you know, the, the media would examine the, the, the Prince of Wales rather than the Queen. And it's not that that was unfair. It's just it's just an obvious and apparent um, uh, characteristic. I think. Peter, can I ask you, just, you, you mentioned the metronomic routine. What, yeah. what, what, what was it like? Would you describe what, what was that routine? Uh, without 
Without breaking too much confidence, a, a working day after reading all the briefings in the morning that endlessly had been produced the night before would start at 10 and it would uh, in the morning and the Prince would do seven or eight engagements a day pretty much during a working week. He would finish either at 8.30 after a drinks reception or 10 10.30 if there'd been a dinner that night and then he'd quickly catch the news at 10 headlines and then he would work until about midnight and when the clock struck then then he would go off to bed sort of thing and that would be week in week out and yes there were protracted periods where he'd you know be at, up, up in Scotland or uh, you know uh, away for the weekend but during the sort of the crunch periods that would just be months and months and again without the, the I remember looking at his diary. I ran, ran his diary as one of the things. I looked at a period from April through to October. There were four hours of free time that I could, I could fit people in to see him in that period. That's outside some of the sort of up at the moral time in, in, in the middle of the summer, but that was how tight and how pressured it was. And Peter, so, one final question. What, what did you read, having been in there and having looked at the Prince of Wales, the Clarence House operation and the Buckingham Palace operation, I expect that when the Queen dies, there's going to be this incredible, you know, bizarrely even given her age, sadness and shock and reckoning. But there will also then be in a, the beginnings of a question, which is, what's the new monarchy going to look like? What's the new king going to? How's the new king going to operate? And I just wondered whether you can help us think about that. Thinking, okay, well, how is it going to be different? I think fr from from what I saw, the sort of the routine and the sort of the, the metronomic na nature of the, pr the prince's work routine was replicated you know it was at the big house that it was the same it, ru it runs on rails you know um, and so I think that will be very much the same what I'd be hopeful of is that you know in, in military parlance because I'm an ex-military guy but he would be set up for success and so what I'd hope is that in the next few months and years a little bit more of the of the passing on of the baton, not the official roles and the actual mm -hmm. passing of power, but but some of these sort of a little bit more um, of what we saw with the state opening of parliament goes on. I don't think it will be. I, I saw in some of the comments people were saying, "Oh, you know, he may he may go off a little bit off offline in terms of policy and politics and things like that." I really don't think so. I think he's he's wise enough, having seen what he's seen for you know the last half century, to know what his role will be and how he'd be expected to fulfill it. I think the pain has been from when I was there, where, as I said, there were sort of 700 organisations or so, and he was deeply involved with fingers in many pies. The constriction of that has been particularly painful, I think, for him um, to do, but he's absolutely recognised that he's had to do it because, you know, the sands of time are running out and, uh, you know, there will be a, a, a passage. I, I guess my final observation is one far more for the public in that, all most of us, a vast majority of, unless you are, you know, almost a centurion, is all we've ever known is is Her Majesty the Queen. And so, whatever change there is, and people are tentative to resistance change, it will be different. And so, if all you've ever known in your life is one thing, this is going to be a change. Well, Peter, it's really interesting to hear from you. I'm going to, I'm going to before I go back to to Giles and Ingrid and David. Thank you for your patience. I just want to hear. There's so many people who've got, made points in the chat. I'd like to bring them in. I, I would love um, Yelena Sofronovich. I'd love you just to tell us, just in brief, if you've just watched The Crown, who is Prince Charles? What do you, what do you? Think <laughs> that's a, that's a good question. Um, I was just pointing out in the chat that his character really developed over time from what I, I saw of the crown. And I should say that I'm I'm really not a, a monarchist. I'm not that interested in the royal family, but I was quite a devout watcher of the crown because I found um, I, I found their portrayals very interesting, but also I found the, the political context of the time. And actually, I loved seeing how the prime ministers were portrayed. Um, but to talk about Prince Charles, he very much as a, as a young boy, I put in the chat that it fosters this kind of soft boy appearance of him. I do think you get that romantic um, look at him, certainly at his time at Gordonston. Um, but I think, again, tying back to what I said, it's as much a portrayal of the age. And I'm really interested in what Giles said about um, if you want to judge someone in their portrayal and you judge what the world was like when they were 21, because I've just, well, I'll be turning 23 this summer, but I was 21 all throughout COVID. So I wonder how that will impact how I might be portrayed or think of this time in the future. 
we will, we will, we will book in the yeah. you know, <laughs> thinking for uh, 50 odd years to, from now, Elena, and see the, see the impact. Listen, I, I'd like to also, if I can, bring in Jeffrey Gruden and my colleague Kerry Thomas as well. Jeffrey, you, you, your argument is, is a little bit, at least in the chat, is it seems to be at odds with Giles's, which is that most likely he's not going to put all his passions and interests aside when he becomes king. Well, the point I'm making is that, of course, there are so many powers which the monarch has. And in theory, those powers can be exercised. But, but convention from probably the early part of the 19th century is that those powers will, will only be exercised on the advice of ministers. And effectively, that, that makes the crown or the queen or the king as Charles will be effectively a rubber stamp. I know they can advise or warn. Now, I'm not suggesting that if a situation like September 2019 and, and the prorogation of parliament happens, Charles will, will refuse. I think that would be a very extreme thing. But I, I feel in my bones from some of the things he said and um, from the fact that he's uh, can, you know, he, he's got real views which he's made plain in terms of, for example, religion or climate change or so on, that I think he would be much more questioning if he's faced with a situation where the executive wants him to exercise his power in a way that he regards as disproportionate or unfair or unjust. Mm. Geoffrey, th thank you. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that, if I might, to Giles in a moment. I just want to bring in my colleague, Kerry Thomas, because we've talked about Prince Charles before in the context, of course, of, you know, the big arguments around Chelsea Barracks and the way in which Prince Charles does step into the public square, but doesn't necessarily want to play by the rules that others play by in the public square. So, Kerry, I don't know what you, what, what, how do you th think of him? I found the Chelsea Barracks moment really interesting because I think it, um, for me- what happened, because I don't think it- made I, will, I will, I will. So, um, so this was, I think, a 2010, 2010, 2011, somewhere around there. Chelsea Barracks, the stretch of land, Chelsea Barracks between Sloane Square and the River Thames, so right in kind of central London, Charles's kind of patch. And uh, a huge planning development had been approved. Uh, Richard Rogers, exactly the kind of architecture that Prince Charles doesn't like. Um, the thing was ready to go. It had been approved, gone through the planning process, gone through the democratic process, let's remember that. And late in the day, uh, Prince Charles began a very, very deliberate, sustained campaign to have the project killed. It took him a couple of months. Um, he lobbied uh, He lobbied people in this country, but the thing that killed it in the end was that he got in touch with the Emir of Qatar and with the Prime Minister of Qatar. And through those two channels, he managed to, to kill this project, which as I say, you know, had been through all the democratic processes in this country and had been approved. Uh, so I think it, for me, it gives the lie to the idea that this is a man who, understands the boundaries of the role and will stick to them because he absolutely did not. He didn't do it then, and he didn't do it in a very deliberate and, and knowing way. He was, and I, I, I think it, it just makes me question for all that we've talked about, the good deeds and the importance of the Prince's Trust and, and um, you know, all, all, that, all that important stuff. There is something there that maybe as, as Giles and Peter have said when, um, when he becomes the constitutional monarch, he, 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 I, 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 I suspect that that kind of intervention would be too risky and, and not something he'd want to entertain. But it troubles me that he did entertain it 10 years ago as Prince, Prince of Wales. Kerry, thank you. I, I'm going to come to William Jeremy and to Claire Montague in a moment. But Giles, what, what do you make of that? Because you'll have heard that point made before, haven't you, that that actually his behavior before he becomes king has been very different to the behavior, obviously, of the queen before she became queen. So what, what do you think? So much more similar in a way to his father's behavior um, as being somebody who felt he could be an interventionist in areas in which he had knowledge, expertise, and people seemed to agree with him. 
For example, the Duke of Edinburgh was president of the National Playing Fields Association and was regularly trying to protect playing fields, which we all think is a marvelous thing to do. We want young people to have places to play. But it was frustrating if you were a builder and felt you'd legitimately got planning permission that that playing field actually should be a housing estate. And there you had the queen's husband saying no through this charity, I'm doing everything I can for it to continue being a playing field. So the problem is, unless you're going to do nothing at all, once you come into areas where mm, there are differences of opinion, as there are on most things, you're liable to get into trouble now and again. And as the Prince of Wales, you can get away with that. As the sovereign, you can't. But I don't think that in a sense matters because we, we I, wouldn't th I don't think of him as a political animal. Uh, and I think maybe journalists do, but the people don't. They see him as a social and a cultural phenomenon. Uh, they're watching the crown, not for the politics. They're watching the crown for the goss. Mm -hmm. it, I know it, it, it depresses the members of the royal family. Uh, I asked the Duke of Edinburgh about it and he said, no, I'm not, I'm not really not into soap opera. Um, so th they're not, they're not gonna be watching that, but, but people are. And I think as it were, as we step into the future, what he will be taking with him is we know what is, is actually, he's got the feeling of the time. Um, we're all talking to flowers now. Do you remember how we used to mock that? We now all think it's a good idea. Um, uh, we all want to embrace all the faiths when he first said it, it was terribly controversial. So I think probably he has moved with us just as William will move with his generation and it will work fine. Charles, it's interesting. I'm gonna, I know Claire Montague has a point to make on this front, but I just wanted to go back to Ingrid Stewart, if I may, because we talk a little bit about, you know, the, 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 the personal dynamics, and I'm nervous to do this because I just don't know the inside story at all, and I'm not sure any of us do. But one of the elements here is, of course, you touched upon, you know, the death of his uh, wife, the death of uh, Diana, his relationship with Camilla, one of the questions that will will arrive as soon as he becomes king is whether or not, and what, what she's called, the treatment of Camilla as the queen, I, um, there's been debate about whether that happens, and for some that's obvious, and for others that's an issue to be resolved. I just wonder whether you could talk through how you see their relationship and what that what happens to that relationship and her in particular when he becomes king. Well, Charles has always made it completely clear that, that Camilla is his wife, and as a wife of the Prince of Wales, she will be, uh, when he becomes king, she will be queen. Um, I, I know that people are... Hold on a second. That wasn't exactly the case, was it? Because after Princess Diana died and he and Camilla, or when he and Camilla got together, the, the understanding was that that was not the title she would take. So it, 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 the, 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 the understanding on that has changed, if not, and not that explicitly, not that publicly. Well, I think it's been through several sea changes, this, this business of what, what Camilla's position is. But um, the Queen very firmly felt that, that this is going way back, that Charles and Camilla had to get married because if something had happened to the Queen, supposing she'd had a riding accident and, uh, and been killed, that then the Charles and Camilla situation was still unresolved. So she really wanted Charles and Camilla to get married and get on with it. So presumably she imagined that, that Charles would make Camilla his Queen when the time came. Um, so I don't think uh, there's really a question of her being princess consort, mm -hmm. um, but there is a worry ab ab about what, the, what globally what people will feel about it because the, the ghost of Diana is never far away and I think this is something very, very difficult that Prince Charles has had to deal with ever mm -hmm. since, you know, since her tragic death. It, it, it keeps reappearing. It reappears in the crown. It reappears in, you know, millions of television documentaries. He's portrayed as a, as a very unkind and uncaring husband. So this has dogged him for the rest of his life. And I don't think um, that he, once he is king, he will he will allow it to influence him any more. I think he's got to take a stand here. Giles, Giles, can I just double check? I'm right, aren't I? That there was that there was an understanding, you know. Ingrid's, Ingrid's phrase, right, the, initially the understanding was that she would be quote unquote princess consort 
And there hasn't been an explicit statement that should yeah, be green. There hasn't been an explicit statement, but I'm I'm with uh, Ingrid in That's the fullness of time. Well, you're so loyal, Giles. <laughs> well, but I also am. There is no doubt anyone, as it were, who has seen uh, the Duchess of Cornwall at close quarters, or indeed seen her in distance, has seen what a success she is at doing what she does, how good she has been for the Prince of Wales, and how good she is as an individual, as an unpretentious person, following her interests and doing her thing. Mm. And I, I am convinced that when the time comes, we will all naturally accept that you have a new king and therefore you have a new queen, and it will just happen. I think they don't want to raise the issue and say, you know, we, we have made an announcement that is going to be, but if you look at the cuttings over recent years, there have been a number of friendly pieces in the papers uh, mm -hmm. from allies saying, you know, it's inevitable she'll be queen. Nobody really argues with it. Yeah. So I think that is what will happen. And I think everybody will accept that. And curiously, the, the reason that we have this royal family still is that they are somehow managed to be, to reflect the world in which we live. When I first went to a garden party, divorced people were not allowed to Buckingham Palace garden parties in my lifetime. You couldn't go if you were Now divorced people are hosting the garden parties. And they reflect the world in which we now live. People have second marriages. People have stepchildren. It sort of works. And I think that's why we will all accept it when the time comes. Giles, I'm going to I, I, I'm I'm going to just I want to come in. I said I see that William Jeremy's got his hands up. Tess Murray and Claire Montague. So I'm going to hear from the three of them and then come back to uh, uh, David to you and to, to Ingrid too. Um, William first. First. Uh, hello. All. Can you hear me? Very well. Very yeah. well. Um, yes. At the risk of sounding like one of Giles's super fans, I do happen to be a fan. <laughs> um, Giles, I was very much struck by your phrase about Philip being, yes, a man of his generation, but also being as modern as tomorrow. And that was all, all about how he was very much in the world in a particular way. And I was wondering whether his life and his work will continue to influence the wider royal family, but Charles in particular, as he moves towards his destiny, as it were. Big question, but you're good at big question. Okay. William, thank you. Tess. Hi, sorry. Um, I I just slightly sort of bristled at this idea that they they represent us. I think that we are in danger of slipping into a sort of cosy chat about um people we feel we know we don't and and we're just sort of sidestepping the bigger issues you know what is the role of a royal family in the 21st century how right-sized is it you know what what possible relevance do these multi multi-millionaires have to most people's lives and also we haven't even touched on the sort of the myth and the mythology that the media supports about the royal family and, and you know in harry's interview the most interesting thing for me was how close he tiptoed to lifting the lid on the collusion and the pact between the media and the royal family. So, you know, I can, you know, I've got all the commemorative coins from Silver Jubilees and God knows what, but there are some really big questions I think we're not tackling here. Mm -hmm. Tess, thank you. Claire Montague. Um, so I suppose the point I was making was about if, if his life work, life's work is as Prince of Wales is to pursue all these interests and to have this convening power and to do all these things with 700 plus charities, there's no evidence of him preparing to hand that over or to create some legacy from his Prince of Wales work. And the consensus appears to be that he understands he can't bring that into his role as sovereign. So he spent sort of 70 years doing these things about which he is truly passionate, but has no sort of succession plan for his Prince of Wales activity and no outlook for that as king. And that, that sort of felt to me like a very odd way of going about things is that you think your life's work is the thing that you do before you take over your destiny. And the other thing that feels very odd is that he's going to take over this job when he's in his what, mid seventies, at a point in time when most people have retired and his only MO has been, sort of bringing people together and, and, and kind of convening them to, to, to pursue his agenda. And he does pursue his agenda hard, whether it's as Kerry said on planning or, or chasing ministers behind the scenes or whatever. 
it's hard to see how he translates into a kind of calmer sovereign model. Claire, th Claire thank you. I'm, I'm going to, if I might, I'm going to go to Ingrid. I'm going to ask you first, just to tackle, sorry, to tackle, I wonder if you tackle just the, the sort of the three related points here. W one is, as you may have seen in the chat, quite a few points about Camilla's popularity, right? Actually, Jane Ann Fox is not comfortable with the idea, or at least makes the point of not being comfortable with the idea of her becoming queen. You'll have seen that my colleague Phoebe, you know, also put up in the chat the popularity ratings of Prince Charles, and then the point that Claire's making, which is a man who historically has been political and now comes to a job in his 70s. All of that speaks to a possibility that actually the monarchy itself faces quite a big challenge in terms of popularity and public support when Charles becomes king. Well, I feel, and probably I would feel this, that when Charles becomes king, that the, the, the people of Great Britain and will be behind him because it will be such a shock to see the Queen go. And people like Tessa, you know, they may not agree that the, the monarchy is something for the 21st century, but the alternative, which is politicians running this country completely and utterly is to my mind not a good idea at all and Prince Charles always said about the monarchy we have no power the only power we have is by the respect that people have for us which is why the royal family gets so upset when maybe younger members um, you know bring it into disrepute and that's what used to really upset people like Prince Philip and the Queen. Prince Philip used to say, well, there goes my life's work, mm -hmm. you know, when, some, when something brought them into disrepute. So I do feel that we will want a king, and I, I, I do feel people will be looking for some... I think people look to the monarchy for guidance, and it's above politics. I really feel that quite strongly. And... We will look to them after the Queen's death, and I think we'll see Charles as having very capable, learned shoulders. And I think, hopefully, people will see uh, the Duchess of Cornwall as being the person behind him that helps him have the strength to, you know, give his life to looking after us and for caring about the planet, for caring about our future. I mean, he's done so much, but he doesn't go around shouting about it. Mm -hmm. And I think. When, when the Queen dies, we will realise a little more of, of exactly what Charles has done for us. And instead of judging him on the fact that we think he's rich and he's got a lot of land and he's got a lovely house, I think we'll look at him and say, this man has really given of himself to his country. Ingrid, thank you. Uh, David McClure, I, I, I wondered whether you could tackle the point that's in Tessa's question about the, the modernity of the monarchy, the extent to which it really is in touch with, with us, and to Kerry's point too about its accountability, and, and whether, you know, given the work that you've done in trying to scrutinise the, the finance of the monarchy, you think that Charles is going to be in any ways more in touch, in any way more accountable? Well, I, I think the problem with accountability is really transparency, particularly financial transparency. Sorry, I was, don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. Uh, Financial transparency. One interesting thing, Charles does, to his credit, does issue an annual report every year where he lists how much tax he pays and all his outgoings, all his expenditure and income. The Queen doesn't do that. It'll be interesting to see, A, when he's king, whether he is more transparent than his mother was. The other question we haven't been talking about is actually to what the slimline monarchy. Charles, 30 years ago at his 40th birthday, did raise the issue of wanting a slimlined, uh, streamlined monarchy, which many people believed meant that you would have instead of 16 working royals, something like six. Now, very little really has happened in the last 30 years about that. And it's really a question of when he is king, A, whether he's really prepared to go the whole hog and not just have six working royals, but maybe cut down some of the extra expenditure, instead of having fewer palaces. You know, do we really need Windsor Castle and, and Buckingham palaces as, a, as official palaces so close to each other? Do, does he really need two private residences, Sandringham and Balmoral, both costing a fortune to run? Now, is he really going to, you know, wield the axe and have a much more modern, relevant monarchy, a slimmer one? I doubt it, because I don't think he's going to have the time. I think one of the problems, which we've been talking about, he's 72 now, he's been waiting 50 years to be king. When he is king, is he really going to say, hey, I'm going to really downsize this whole institution. I somehow doubt it. 
if the queen had, if he'd been king 20 years ago, the queen had abdicated or whatever reason, I think things would have been different. But he will be coming to the, you know, he will be getting the top job in his middle 70s, as someone said, and he's not going to have that much time to do things. So I'm doubtful as to whether Charles will really make the monarchy relevant. And I think there's an argument that you'll probably have to wait a generation to William until you see major changes. David, thank you. Charles, what do you think will change with Charles as king? Well, you're going to get the slimmed down monarchy almost immediately. And they're very conscious of that. Um, uh, when the Duke of Edinburgh became, uh, as it were, the equivalent of Prince Consort in all but name, there was quite a small monarchy. It was just the Queen and Princess Margaret, it had, and the King and the Queen. There were just four in the family that people knew of. And we're going to get something more like that in the near future, because the monarchy is already being slimmed down. Essentially, it's going to be the Princess Royal doing the things that she does, and it's going to be uh, Prince Edward, who is going to become the new Duke of Edinburgh, that's the kind of succession planning that the Duke of Edinburgh had in mind. He let Prince Edward know some years ago when he took on the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme that he would become the next Duke of Edinburgh. Um, so you will have them in the family. And then you will have Prince Charles and his son, Prince William and Catherine. They will be the next generation. So it will be, it will be slimmer. They do think about the succession and how it works. But I don't think they can think too far down the line. They know this is a show that's been running for more than a thousand years. It seems to be a brand that people find attractive. Um, and I suspect it will go on because for all sorts of reasons, it's absolutely central to brand Britain. Uh, they don't like being personalities. They felt once they became celebrities, that was making life more difficult for them. But I think it works by consent. And I suspect that we are consent, we are probably more enthusiastic about it than they are. Jeez. I certainly, talking to the, uh, the, the Duke of Edinburgh and other senior members of the royal family, they had seen it, they've seen it all. If you'll live as long as the Duke of Edinburgh, whose grandfather was assassinated, who lived in exile in the 20s, who in the 1930s saw you know, the rise of, of, of Hitler and the abdication of uh, the person who became the Duke of Windsor. Then all we had the Princess Margaret. They've seen it all. They have seen it all, the ups and downs, and yet the thing goes on. And the Duke of Edinburgh once pointed out to me, I said, you're so dynamic, you're getting ahead. And uh, he said, yes, but there is a balance here. And the queen is quite conservative. And I said, oh, is the queen conservative? He says, yes. I said, why is that? He said, well, the queen, I think, is conservative because she believes in going at the pace of the slowest person in the kingdom so that nobody should feel left behind. Hmm. Charles, thank you. I'm, I'm, as you. As you were speaking, I noticed um, uh, Gregory Mulligan had written that this was the most utterly baffling thinking I've listened to. I'm on another planet. And I was reminded of the fact that there's this fascinating it's a fascinating thing actually about this whole subject that for some people it inhabits one, if you like, sort of side of the brain and for others completely another. I think the thing that for me, and I, and I said at the beginning that I hope it would help us think about our journalism. Obviously the difficulty with, with talking about and certainly journalism around the Royals is that the stories are so interesting. You know, you're exactly right, Giles, that you know you don't watch The Crown for kind of constitutional analysis, but for the gossip. And you, can all, you can't help yourself get into it. But I have to say, I'm rather chastened by the point Tess made, not, not from a standpoint of, you know, questioning the validity of the monarchy, but more from understanding its modernity. And I, and I found myself writing at the beginning of this, a kind of, who is he? question mark with, and then scribble down lots of stories and came away in the course of the conversation writing down but how does he relate to his times right this point that you made about his his his, his childhood his, his his family but more importantly his times in these three respects the country as in the shape of the united kingdom and the four nations of the united kingdom what happens if that geography changes Democracy, and I take, David, your point about accountability, you know, transparency is such a good measure of that. And then finally, identity, this question of who he actually represents and how. And actually, for us, I think, in tortoise, we're not going to be trying to 
chase, if you like, the classic daily newspaper stories on, on the royals. But I think that might be a really interesting way of trying to understand him and his plans for the monarchy. So uh, as well as hearing uh, um, stories and learning more about him as a personality, I hope that it's given other people a framework for thinking about this. It certainly has for me. Um, I'm very much aware there are a lot of people who had a lot of other um, uh, uh, great points um, and 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 not to mention fun questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them, but I do want to say, hang on a second, someone's holding up your, what's your mug, Charles? I know you're muted. What's it say? I can't know you need, hang on, you're muted, Charles. I can't hear it. Someone was saying that I have an I love the monarchy mug, which I don't let anyone else use. Um, <laughs> they're right, but this is my favorite mug at the moment. I've had my two jabs. It, it's instead of, we don't need any vaccine passports, we just need a mug to take everywhere. <laughs> do, you have, do you have a series of mugs, Charles, with all of your views, you know, neatly, neatly encapsulated on each of them? <laughs> um, I, I, I do. Charles Brandreth, a big thank you to you, Ingrid Stewart, uh, David McCure. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us. Um, I hope you found it uh, illuminating and interesting. I certainly did. <laughs> uh, I, I said, you really do. You really do, Charles. My goodness. Um, these are great. Wasn't an ancestor of yours beheaded, Giles? Yes, for treason in 1817. Um, but we, <laughs> that's, well, that's enough for me. But what an interesting, and can I say some of the comments about the, the long-term thinking, you're absolutely right. Towards the end, I think we were getting into the real territory. Do we need this thing? It is completely absurd in a way. It's a mixture, isn't it, of fairy tale, heritage, commerce, constitution. I mean, extraordinary. And yet, somehow, it holds us. <laughs> That's the mystery. We will, we will something, <laughs> someone just written in the chat, let's have lunch, Giles. I think there can be a fair few uh, conversations to come. Um, we're looking forward to a time where we do all have lunch together. We do say uh, our thank yous in person. We can't this evening, but we will wave you merrily goodbye. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. Have a very good evening. Thank you.